in general, I think any kind of new economic connectivity is positive. Um, for example, anything that connects um, Nahichivan with the rest of Azerbaijan, which have been separated uh, geographically and economically uh, for 30 years, is obviously positive. Uh, it opens up new economic connections. Hopefully, it will increase uh, prosperity. Um, there will be good for small business people and so on that we get back to some kind of regional connectivity. I guess uh, there are questions, of course. Um, one is, I don't think um, economic connectivity can proceed so far without any kind of political agreement. Um, if there is no uh, political trust between Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, then, uh, for example, um, people will um, throw stones, stand by the, the side of the road and throw stones at trucks or trains which are passing on these new transport routes. Already last week, I was hearing of incidents of stone throwing uh, in Karabakh, which is um, to remind people how things started in 1988 with Armenians and Azerbaijan's journeys throwing stones at vehicles on, on, on the roads. So unless there's some kind of political trust, then this economic connectivity cannot um, proceed so far. Also, I think if this um, economic connectivity leaves out, for example, Nagorno-Karabakh itself, the Armenians there, or is seen the road, a new road across Megri is seen not to benefit Armenians, then again, there will be spoilers. So I think it, this um, economic connectivity is good, but it needs to be have the goodwill and um, contribution of everyone to work effectively. Well, of course, this will be competition for the Baku Tbilisi cars railway. I, I do expect eventually that there will be a new uh, rail connection which would go Baku, Khorajiz, Megri, um, Nakchivan, Yerevan cars, for example. That's a natural uh, connection with, with also a, a route down south to Iran. Of course, this um, I think this is uh, a natural route. It's a lowland route along the river. Um, there's not the no mountains there to cross. It's a natural route which was there um, 30 years ago. I, I think that's generally positive. Uh, of course, it will be a competition to the Georgian route, um, but I think um, that's inevitable. Um, and I think um, Georgia has a few years to, um, you know, to bear in mind what is going to happen um, because with the reopening of this route. I think Georgia has over the years taken it a bit for granted that it is the only and natural transit route across the Caucasus. So I think Georgia will have to work a bit harder, that's, that's for sure. Georgia, I think, should work a bit harder for also, for example, at the Anaklia port project um, to try and... And so this is, I think, as, as we say in English, a bit of a wake-up call for Georgia to improve its infrastructure, its customs, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, it will be a competition, but hopefully competition can also be positive. One should say that I could understand Armenian perceptions given Turkey's active role in the recent war, the use of Turkish drones, which was obviously decisive in the Azerbaijani victory, the Armenian defeat, the um, President Erdogan's participation in the victory parade on December the 10th in Baku, and that, that he even uh, mentioned Enver Pasha, one of the three leaders who destroyed um, you know, one million Ottoman Armenians in 1915. All of these factors obviously increase the perception of threat in, in Armenia towards Turkey, and I can understand that. Having said that, I don't personally think that this, that there is a real um, threat to the Republic of Armenia from Turkey. Um, and I, I think on the level of rhetoric, we can see some kind of increase in Turkish interest in the Caucasus. But I don't, I still don't believe that the Caucasus is a priority area of interest for Turkey or for President Erdogan. Um, I think it's important to note that during the conflict, he made a lot of statements about how he wanted to dissolve the Minsk group, 
how he wanted Turkey to be a um, one of the mediators. There was talk of a joint peacekeeping force. None of that happened. We, we ended up with a Russian peacekeeping force and a few symbolic, 50 symbolic Turkish monitors, um, you know, outside um, a long distance from, from the Karabakh Armenians. So I don't, I don't believe that there is really a serious regional strategy, new regional strategy um, from Turkey towards Armenia and the Caucasus. I, I, I think that the Middle East and Cyprus and other areas are far more important to Mr. Erdogan. It's more of a symbolic uh, gesture towards his big ally, uh, Azerbaijan. Um, and we're also seeing, uh, on the contrary, some contrary um, you know, suggestions from Turkish officials about opening the border with Armenia. So um, it's a threat um, perception in Armenia, but I don't believe that there is any real um, significant and actual threat um, by Mr. Erdogan uh, towards Armenia. It's, it's more on the kind of symbolic and ideological level. Turkish business is, is quite strong. Um, Turkish um, consumer goods were until last year very popular in Armenia coming through Georgia. So, um, but I think this all depends on the um, willingness of the Armenian consumer uh, to buy the goods. It, it, it depends on the willingness of Armenian landlords to let their property to Turkish companies. No, you know, there can be no agorization, there can be no big economic intervention in Armenia without the consent and will of, of the Armenians. And I, I don't think that's going to happen uh, at the moment. Um, in general, I think, you know, um, it would be economically beneficial for uh, Armenia for the border to open. Obviously, more Turkish goods will come in and some Turkish businesses, but it's also a new uh, land route. Uh, to the west for Armenia, if the railways open, they, they don't have to go north to the Black Sea, to Batumi. Uh, Armenian goods can go directly across Turkey towards Europe, that would be positive. And also, um, you know, Yerevan is a much bigger regional centre than any of the eastern Turkish cities, you know. So, for example, a few years ago, I heard one of the ambassadors in Yerevan say to me that some big company had been uh, interested to see if they could base themselves in Yerevan, some Western, I think, pharmaceutical company. And they decided not. They decided the Armenian market was too small. But they said if, if that um, Western company could also serve Eastern Turkey, then suddenly the market would be much bigger. So Yerevan, I think, would be a more attractive investment center for big international companies if they could serve not just Armenia, but Eastern Turkey. So I think in economically, there's a lot to be said for opening of the border cooperation. Um, but obviously I'm not naive. I know that there are psychological problems, that there are historical problems, there are political problems between Turkey and Armenia. So I'm not talking about the near future, but I'm talking about you know, five years, 10 years time. I think this could be very positive if, if the political climate improves. It's a, it's a very important question which requires uh, a long answer. I wrote, I wrote a whole book uh, entitled Great Catastrophe, which sort of in very much of which deals with these issues. First of all, I think it's the important, the first thing to say is that I, I call it the Armenian genocide. Um, it happened in 1915. There were two million Armenians in Ottoman Turkey. And then a few years later, there were almost none that they were either destroyed, killed, um, forcibly assimilated or, or deported and, 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 you know, went to the Middle East and, and became the Armenian diaspora in places like the United States as a result of that act of mass killing during the First World War. Um, you know, it was the worst atrocity of the First World War against civilians, the, the, the mass destruction of the Ottoman Armenians. I think that's the first thing to say. Um, it happened and, 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 you know, one can read dozens of history books and memoirs and uh, journalistic accounts. It, at the time, it was no secret. It, the denial of it really only happened because there was a long silence about it, both amongst the Armenians themselves and in Turkey, it was kind of forgotten. 
and then remembered in the 1950s, 1960s, um, uh, and then denied in Turkey during that period. But there was no doubt about it at the time. Um, I think there are, the important thing to say is that there are kind of two connected but parallel issues here. What happened to the Ottoman Armenians, the fact they were destroyed and murdered and deported, and this question of just justice for that, and the debate about the word genocide, which was invented 30 years after the killing of the Armenians, invented in the shadow of the Holocaust. Um, I understand why um, it's important for Armenians to use the word genocide, um, which was invented in 1944 in the shadow of the Holocaust. Um, but I think it's a shame that it's become the only question um, because, you know, I think uh, we call, we talk about the Holocaust, about the Shoah, there doesn't, there's not this focus on the legal technical word genocide when it comes to the Holocaust. And in the Armenian case, unfortunately, the, it's, it's as though this one legal technical word genocide has taken up all the debate. I, I personally, I would, I would call it the Armenian genocide, but I would hope for a bigger debate of, about justice, about cultural monuments in Turkey, about history, about memory, about reconciliation, all those things. Um, and I don't, um, you know, I, I think that the, the genocide debate has crowded out those uh, discussions. So um, it's quite possible that the US government will use the word genocide. Um, I think they, they probably should, but they should also, that shouldn't be the end of the story. That should be the beginning of, of a wider discussion about history, about what happened in the First World War, also what happened to uh, other people during that, that period who also suffered, many Turks and Kurds and Azerbaijanis also suffered during that period. So I would like to see a, a broader discussion. And I would also hope um, that people who start to use the word genocide officially for the first time understand there could be some negative repercussions also in Turkey, particularly for the small um, Armenian community in Istanbul, possibly even some negative re repercussions for the Armenian monuments in Turkey, although I hope that won't happen. Um, it's important to remember that the, you know, the coalition part of, partner basically of, of the current government in Turkey is the very nationalist MHP party. So I think, you know, it would be normal if, if, if the US government calls this a genocide, almost everyone else does around the world, but they, sh they should, uh, it would be naive to expect that this will, will not have some kind of impact. And I hope it could be part of a bigger discussion about uh, justice and memory for the Armenians and reconciliation with Turks, rather than just a, uh, the kind of um, a one small political gesture on, on behalf of the US government. Um, and you asked me a question. You asked me a question about Mount Ararat. I mean, I heard, I, I, I saw those reports. I guess at the end of last year. I haven't heard anything. It would again be maybe natural that um, Azerbaijan and Turkey would want somehow to retaliate against such a move in the U.S. by showing flags on Mount Ararat, which could be seen from Yerevan. I, I think we can, you know, we can expect this kind of war of symbols unfortunately to occur um, um but I, I i think unfortunately this is the big sh shadow still um overhanging the armenians and also the turks and the whole region really this the fact that this story of the destruction of the of almost all of the armenians in turkey in 1915 was never really talked about properly at the time there was no justice for it um and so I think, in, you know, it needs to be tackled and maybe maybe a big statement from the US government will cause some short term problems, but, but could be helpful maybe in the longer term. The situation with archives, I think, is a bit different on each side. Um, first of all, I think we know an enormous amount. I, I think we know 95% you know, of the story of what happened. Um, there are Armenian church archives have been opened. There are a lot of Turkish documents. There are masses of diplomatic documents from, you know, US and, and British 
diplomats and aid workers and journalists and lots, thousands and thousands of memoirs and oral histories. So I don't think we're going to learn a huge amount. Um, but I think um, there is one um, specific issue on the Armenian side, which is that in Watertown, um, in fact, I've been in the, in the very building where those archives are found. There's a basement full of the archives of the Dashnak Sutun government of the First Republic of Armenia from 1918 to 20. And those archives are in the basement and basically only very few people have access to them. And those archives undoubtedly have information, not so much actually about the Turks, but about the mistreatment of Azerbaijani community, um, a Shia community in the First Republic 1918 to 20, when many of them were thrown out from Zangazur or thrown out from villages in Armenia and some of them were killed um, to make way for, for Ottoman Armenians. So there's some dark secrets, I guess, in there. Not so much about 1915, but about the period 1918 to 20 uh, that's for sure and maybe there's some other lots of other interesting information there as well um, we just don't know on the turkish side i think talking to historians my impression is that uh, there was a lot of so-called spring cleaning of the ottoman archives and that um a lot of the important documents uh, from the ottoman archives were simply destroyed maybe in the 1970s and 1980s and um, it would be good to have those archives open up. You have to read the Ottoman language, which is um, Ottoman script, which is very difficult. So maybe there were some secrets there, but I, I, I don't think we should hope for too much from those archives. Well, I mean, obviously it would be very negative if there was a, a, a big military escalation in, in Donbass. There's already been a small one, um, but I don't think it would have a big impact on the Caucasus, to be honest. Um, I think President Erdogan, I didn't, I didn't really answer your question about Russian-Turkish relations, I think has quite a good mutual understanding with President Putin. The two men, they talk, uh, they disagree on a lot of issues, but they understand each other. They think in quite a similar fashion. They're both uh, quite cynical, real politique politicians. Um, and I don't believe that President Erdogan really cares about Ukraine. Um, he hasn't shown much sympathy for the Crimean Tatars, to be honest. Much, um, many people have expected him um, to show much more sympathy for them. So I don't, I don't believe that he's going to make a big issue of a, of a new escalation in Ukraine. I don't believe the Armenians want to get involved. Um, they still have a diplomatic relations with Ukraine. So I, 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 I don't. It would, of course, be negative, but I don't think it would have a major impact on the Caucasus. 